Yeah, welcome back to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. Our first major conversation this morning is still about the topic of re reintegration of repentant Boko Haram members. Now, the national chairman of the Arawa Consultative Forum, al has released a statement um, regarding this, basically criticizing the government for attempting to reintegrate these repentant Boko Haram members into society. They say what they need is a fair trial. Let's invite public affairs analyst, Mr. Ahmed Buhari, to discuss this. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's good to be here. All right, let's first get your initial reaction to the concept of the Nigerian army now saying they are um, accepting surrendered or repentant Boko Haram terrorists into society rather than, you know, go ahead to do what many Nigerians expect of them, which is ensuring that these people are prosecuted. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, with regards to the issue that concerns uh, the repentant Boko Haram members, um, you know, it, it's very hard for some of us to hear that uh, they're going to be forgiven and reintrodu reintroduced into the system as normal people. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that they're not going to be normal people uh, at this stage. But also, it's important for us to realize that um, these are people that the nation has failed. Uh, when Boko Haram started its campaign massacring people in the Northeast, they didn't just massacre people. At different times, they stole people, people who have been neglected by the system, by the government, who couldn't be protected by the police. And these people were not just stolen, but they were stolen and then um, reintroduced to a new ideology. In other words, they were polluted to become murderers, killers, and what have you. People were stolen, families were stolen, and brothers were made to rape sisters. Brothers were made to rape mothers. Sons were made to actually kill fathers. And these are the kind of people that they, they were turned into become, they radicalized them. So yes, they have committed heinous crimes. Yes, uh, on the other hand, the government, the system has also failed in trying to protect them from these criminals called Boko Haram. So in my opinion, it is very important for us to I'll always look at it from both sides and understand that just the way it happened in Liberia, Sierra Leone, where young children were picked up and actually stolen by um, people who had some crazy agenda, taking these young children to different places and making them become monsters is exactly what has happened in the Northeast. You know, um, I remember there was a story of a young girl who was rescued by the Nigerian army and she actually found her way and ran back to the den of the Boko Haram people. In other words, her mindset has changed. But at the same time, are we going to now say we have failed to protect them at the same time now that we have rescued them, what we now try to do to them is to kill them? I don't well, think so. But Mr. Mr. Think Buhari, the, Mr. Buhari, yes, please. The, the, the challenge here, I believe, is um, being able to distinguish between who is a Boko Haram fighter and who is a victim or a, 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 an abduct, abductee, someone who has been taken by Boko Haram. Um, I can assure you that. So what else, are you saying now that these hundreds, these thousands, you know, that we see in, in the news every other week that the government claims to have surrendered and repented are all people who were simply taken from their villages and made to carry out these crimes and not necessarily terrorists. And how do you that, differentiate between both? To be honest, I cannot differentiate between both. But at the same time, I want us to be mindful of the fact that we have failed as a country, as a government, as a system, to protect the lives of these people from being stolen by uh, what I would like to call criminals, Boko Haram criminals. Now we have found a way to get them back, and the first thing we're thinking of doing is kill them. In my opinion, I think we must be careful. I think we must be apologetic for actually not safeguarding these people. I know a lot of... Um, girls that were stolen like at the early stages of this Boko Haram mayhem and they could have children that are like 12 year olds now those children I'm assuring you can hold weapons and have become you know like Boko Haram and I'm saying when we get to rescue these people are we trying to kill them because we failed them in the first place I want us to have a rethink I'm not protecting anybody here I don't care about um you know Boko Haram or the nonsense that they have done to my people or my communities. But I'm just saying that there are brothers and sisters of ours 
who have also been stolen for years who are actually part of this Boko Haram members. And I'm sure I'm assuring you that those are the information that the military know that makes them feel reluctant sometimes to just go out on everybody because they do know that there are some innocent people that have been compelled to be part of this unfortunate scenario that we couldn't stop from happening. So, so, so can any, you know, terrorist claim that he didn't initially want to be a terrorist, but... You know, he was failed by the government and he, you know, sought solace with, you know, terrorists from Iran or from Libya and, and whatnot. And then the government agrees that, okay, yes, we failed you, so let's forgive you and bring you home. Nearly, nearly all of them want to save their lives right now. Nearly all of them will say that. But at the same time, what I think we should be doing as a country right now is to put a mechanism in place that can help reorientate these people and remove them from that ideology. I'm not saying you should release them to the, to the streets. I'm saying you're still going to have to lock them up and see how you can reorientate them and bring their minds back to what we think normal people should be thinking at this stage. But for us to gather them all, all up together after we have failed to protect them from being stolen and say we want to kill them, I have some concerns about that. So, Mr. Buhari, this issue is very dicey, the way I see it. It is very dicey. It you know, is. But I want us to begin first with this question. Can a Boko Haram terrorist who invade communities, rape women, abduct children, be de-radicalized? He was radicalized in the first place. I believe that he can be de-radicalized. This is a mental um, doctor, a psychologist question. I wouldn't know how far they can go with trying to get these people back to their senses. But I think it's possible. If you can go left, you definitely can go right. So, Buhari, um, in saner climes, right, we can argue that they have all the infrastructure in place regarding people who, you know, went to school for these sort of things, who learned about psychosocial supports and, and, you know, things like this. But in a country like Nigeria, where even, you know, social workers, who people who studied this in school, are even, you know, looked down on, do you think Nigeria as a country and even the military have the infrastructure regarding the personnel, the resources, the facilities, you know, to house repentant Boko Haram terrorists and begin to work on their minds from the inside out. Do you think we have the resources and facilities to do so? I don't know. I'm not in the army. I'm not in the, with the government. I, would do, I wouldn't know what they have put in place. But I also want to remind us that the government has failed. It has failed the people of those areas. It has failed to the, the citizens of this country. And so um, it must stand firm to making sure that they protect these people. Um, so, not because they have, not because, not because they mm -hmm. have killed people. No, not because they have killed people, but because we have failed as a government, as a system, as a country to protect them from getting stolen. I know a lot of cheap girls who have been rescued who still have their mindsets back to the camps because they have found lovers or comfort or friends. The reason why some of these boys actually walk into the Boko Haram dens to surrender themselves to be part of the Boko Haram is because they find even better solace there where they're being given food or taken care of or have a sense of belonging alone. And they go to those places, which means we must wake up as a country and start thinking of other places where this could actually happen and make sure we do not fail our citizens anymore. So, okay. so, so, so is, it, is it the name that is a challenge here because it, would it be better to, to call them victims instead of call, calling them Boko Haram terrorists? If the government says that we're rehabilitating um, ex-Boko Haram, former Boko Haram, repentant Boko Haram uh, terrorists, it, it, it makes very little sense. Um, so would it be better from your analysis to call them victims and people who necessarily aren't terrorists but people who the government had failed and they're victims of this system? You know, it's very, very hard. Like, like, like my, my, my friend here said, she said it's dicey. It is indeed dicey. I thought about this. The first thing that crossed my mind was, what are we even talking about? This guy should have been killed before even captured. But even in the worst of wars, once the enemy raises a white flag, the morale says that you shouldn't shoot at him anymore. He has killed like a thousand of your people. But you, at that point, he's surrendering. You pick him up and you be, he becomes a prisoner of war. And then from there, you can push forward to try him and making sure you know what is, what, where he really stands and how, he wants to, how you want to proceed with him. So what I am saying here is we must 
take your course. I know emotions are running. I know there are sentiments running. But at the same time, we must also caution ourselves and ask ourselves, how did these people get here in the first place? What lapses are on our, on our part it, were occurred that made them become what they have become? And so we, 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 we should know where exactly to point our fingers at a time like this. And it's to the government. Okay, so Mr. Buhari, this issue really is something I want us to take step by step because there's just a lot, you know, that is shrouded in mystery right now. I want us to maybe try this analogy if it'll make us understand it better. When you go to universities and even, you know, out in the real world, there are lots of people who get peer pressured into courtism. They were from good homes. They're good people. They never wanted to be courtists, but they were forced, threatened or pressured into it. And these people might not go ahead and kill people, commit crimes. I want to understand where you're coming from. Are you then saying that the punishment for a crime of a cultist who had killed people and done evil, you know, should be different because he was forced into cultism or peer pressured into cultism from someone who, from the get-go, was a quote-unquote bad boy who really wanted to be a cultist? Is that what we're saying? And when we look at it and compare it to the Boko Haram situation, are we also saying that people, because they were forced, they were kidnapped, they were abducted from their homes, and were forced into terrorism, and have gone ahead to actually kill people and commit crimes, then their sentences should be lower because they were forced into it? Please help me understand, Mr. Buhari. That's not what I'm saying. And it's very important for us to know that cultism that you described as it is in most Nigerian schools and this situation are two different things. These were people that were kidnapped, taken to camps, radicalized. I'm telling you, I, I, I'm telling you I, we have gotten stories from people who have returned that very clearly you see how they were made to hate themselves but, first. But Harry, my I mean, question, look at the story Buhari, that, Buhari, look, sorry, look I want you to things, understand my question. Look, look at the things that the question is in. about the, will. Buhari, the question is about will. You're saying that these, and, these people were kidnapped, so they never wanted to be part of Boko Haram in the first place, they, right? They, they, never, they never wanted, wanted to. Never, so, so are you saying that because they never willed to be part of Boko Haram, even if they have committed crimes that are punishable by law, crimes like murder, then they should be pardoned? Is that what you're if you, saying? If you, if, if you heard me correctly, I never used, in all of the talks that we've had in the last 15 minutes, I didn't use the word pardoned. I am saying we should be mindful. We should realize that as a people we have failed them and that we should have them tried i said try i said we should have them tried however we should also realize that as much as emotions are running high mm -hmm. these people are victims of circumstances not all of them most of them mm -hmm. which is where i expect the the agencies to do a thorough job to ensure that there are some people who in in in, in all honesty were picked were stolen as a result of the failure of a government who was not able to be there to protect them. And that's what I'm saying. All right. Um, Mr. Buhari, um, before we bring in our second guest, uh, I think we have uh, Nika Gule also joining us. Um, there is um, a challenge that I also want to point out, you know, and that is, once again, you know, the way that this has been explained. It, you know, it seems like some level of arrogance from the Nigerian government with regards to the way they simply say that they are, you know, rehabilitating and pardoning former Boko Haram terrorists. Um, you know, it doesn't in any way sit well with the Nigerian people, and there's nobody really who has been able to bring up, you know, your angle from the Nigerian government to make people maybe understand it better. That's one. It, and it, it, second it's is, important. Yeah. Okay, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, but it's important apologies. that but, we should but the always thing remember. That, yeah, just let me throw this in. How do you explain Sorry, yeah. this um, or your narrative or your perspective to a victim's family, to a person who has lost eight family members who were brutally murdered, killed in their sleep um, by these same terrorists, regardless of how they got into the terrorist organization? But how do you explain this to the thousands of families who are currently living in IDP camps because they've lost all they have, including their loved ones? to these same terrorists? What, what would be the best way to say to them that these people who committed these crimes, regardless of how they got in, are being forgiven, maybe, or rehabilitated by the government? You know, in 2018, I, I, was, I was running for office of the president, and I think that made, uh, that made some name for myself, and I got invited to Rwanda by President Paul Kagame, and one of the reasons why Paul Kagame invited me and some other young people across Africa was because he wanted to kind of mentor us and let us see, understand some of the 
concerns Africans are going through. And at that time, one of the places that he made us visit was the memorial ground in, in, in Kigali. And at that time, we saw mass graves of about 200 people here, 1,000 people there, and, a, 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 and an institution that was designed by the government to see how they can reconcile the people. There were people who smashed people's children on the people's children's heads on trees on walls and they were still alive and their families were still alive and what they did was the families were made to interface with those people who actually committed those crimes and asked those people to ask for forgiveness and pleaded with them now the government knew very well that if it wanted to lock people or kill people it was going to kill nearly everybody in rwanda but at the same time they knew that some people actually got involved in all of those crimes because they were foolishly radicalized to be part of those things the point i'm making is as a people if we do not put closure to these things we will never be able to forge ahead there are some boko haram members that have escaped the real ones have escaped they're going to regroup they're going to come back what we're trying to do is to have a system that we design that will make some of these people resist any kind of future radicalization we need to talk to our citizens and, and you know, in all in all fairness to this situation, I can imagine what the people in IDP camps are going through. I can imagine what some women are going through after their husbands have been killed, their children have been maimed, and you are asking them to allow those guys to be forgiven. I'm not saying they should be forgiven. I'm saying they have to go through a process of de-radicalization so that we can see how much and how easily we can reintegrate them into the system. Because if we continue like this, it's going to be a vicious cycle. Right. Let me remind us. One of the reasons why Boko Haram thrived from the beginning was because the early Boko Haram members that were captured, what they did to them was they actually shot them in open light. And at that time, they weren't killing people. They were still actually trying to create a stance for themselves. It's the same thing going on in the Southeast. I believe that the Southeasterners have got a, a, a reason. They, they, they have, a, they have what, what do you call it? There's something they're driving at. They want to express themselves. And I'm, think, I'm saying to all of us is the only thing that we can do right now for the Southeasterners is to stop and listen to them. And then we can now weigh options and tell them all the things that all you right. have asked for are all not right, practicable. And these are the disadvantages. Yeah. These are the disadvantages. I want you to look at them and reason with us. I am assuring you that once somebody is able to sit down with all sides of the divide, people will start thinking normally. All but right, we Mr. cannot Bari. stay on one side and talk over the people and feel superior. It won't work. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there is the body language that we've always mentioned of the current administration. And, you know, or some of these things that you've mentioned don't seem to be in existence with the current administration's body language. Um, and you know, anybody yes. can argue, anybody can argue that victims of Boko Haram, thousands of them across the country, can also feel aggrieved that the people who killed my family have now been forgiven and we want to start our own terrorist organization. And they legitimately, you can now argue 10 years later that the government failed these people and that's the reason they're, you know, killing people, uh, other people today. There's, Absolutely. you know, there's some Absolutely. sense in that argument. Absolutely. All right, Mr. And, and, Buhari, and, and Mr. Buhari, people... just a minute, let's bring in our second guest, who's a public affairs analyst, Mr. Nika Gule. Uh, Mr. Gule, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. All right. So, what sorry is... for the network. Uh, yes. it's, it's really this shows how we are screening in Nigeria. You know. All right. We well, understand. I, this idea. I imagine how seamless we have this conversation. All right, Mr. Agule, let's go straight into it. The Arawa Consultative Forum's National Chairman, Mr. Aldrobe, has responded to, you know, the recent activities of the Nigerian army, um, which is reintegrating re terrorists into society, saying they have repented and have or would be go through a process of de-radicalization. So I'm going to read out a quote from, um, from Ogbe, Mr. Ogbe now. He said is I am sorry enough to bring relief to Nigerians and the thousands of dead and the maimed? Or we also ask, what of those victims bombed in churches and mosques and schools and markets? What of all the men and women in uniform murdered by them? He says, who can count the thousands of widows and orphans they have created? He says, what do we do with them? Do we embrace them and trust them? We seriously doubt. Um, how do you respond to this, Mr. Aguli? I, I very much agree with the views of the SCF chairman, and I totally align with his views. Uh, before I, I go forward, let me, let me say two things. The first thing is that, that it will take ISWAP to come and defeat Boko Haram. It is not a good testament on the performance of our armed forces. We have an armed forces made, of, made up of three services.
Baptist, backed up with a they were fighting Boko Haram. So what I'm saying is that that he has to take a swap to come and do the job for the Niger of the performance of our armed forces. I mean, I, I, they, they've tried to protect us, but it doesn't sound well that he has to take a ragtag band of terrorists to come and defeat Boko Haram for us. The Nigerian government, the current Nigerian government, has not shown fairness in dealing with issues of insecurity in the country. Seems we have challenges with uh, the connection from Nika Gule. Uh, we would Talking about reintegrating Boko Haram, the government falls here and deals with the situation ruthlessly. Are you with me? Yes. Oh, uh, well, yes. Hello? Uh, go ahead, Mr. Gule. We're going to struggle through okay. it. Okay. So go ahead. So what I'm saying is that the, the current Nigerian government is not showing that it is fair in dealing with insecurity across the nation. Whereas the likes of Boko Haram in the North are being treated with what will look like kid gloves. Government ruthlessly deals with insecurity elsewhere in the country. I can give you an example. In Benue State, earlier in the year, a, a, a group of bandits, you know, murdered a security for the mother members of the Nigerian army. And the government, this present government, they went to Conchisha local government. They bombed the bank. They, they arrested those who were responsible. Even the governor of Benoist, they handed them over to the government for prosecution. Those people, as we speak, are in detention. The same thing is happening in the East where the ESM members are being, are being tackled by the security. Sunday Boho's case is there. We know what has happened there. Mr. Agule, it's unfortunate that uh, we're, we're struggling to hear from you. But um, let's bring in Mr. Buhari now to continue this conversation. Mr. Buhari, can you hear us? Now we can reconnect with Nick Agule on the Clara um, network. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, so... Um, we read through um, Audio Bay's statements and we understand where he's coming from, as well as your perspective, you know, especially since you went ahead to Rwanda to visit the country to, I mean, Rwanda had one of the worst cases of, you know, what you call the genocide, the Rwandan genocide. It was very terrible, a very dark time in, in the history of Rwanda. So I can also understand your perspective coming from there to see how it's now one of the most peaceful countries. You know, it has, you know, green development and all of that. But Aldo Egbe's last statement, you know, in this um, press release he put out was that if Nigerians all continue to accept this terrorist, that our action is punishable by, he calls it, by more insurrection and more anarchy. Do you disagree with that? Well, he has a point. Um, at the same time, we must look at the, um, the situation in the Niger Delta. Uh, I, I listened to a good lady just speak about um, in the internet in Nigeria is the worst in the world, but it's not true. It happens anywhere. You can have internet connectivity. I also listened to him say things like um, uh, people were handed over to the Nigerian government and they're still in detention. The truth of the matter is if they had been killed by now, Amnesty International would have come to say, why didn't you try them? Why didn't they go through the right processes? I think we must, uh, we must support ourselves as a people, as a government. We must actually stand with ourselves. The more we tear ourselves apart, the more nothing will hold. Um, you know, I, I, I've weighed all of this from every angle, and I think the biggest problem we have in our country is our inability to communicate with the people. I think people just want, uh, is either people are so lazy or people are too proud to speak very carefully and gently to the people that they have promised and sworn to protect and say, this is how I think we want to go about this and listen to what the polls from the people. Yes, we have issues around the country, but if you look at it critically, they didn't just start today. Uh, Boko Haram, for example, is, is going to, to close to 20 years now. And, and before now, I've been saying to everybody that wants to listen, the northern part of this country has never been peaceful. From the times when you've been traveling by, by public transport and you realize that your taxi driver is parking on the side of the road and you're asking him why he's parking, and he's telling you that he has not noticed any car come from the opposite direction in the last 40 minutes. And so you wait. 
And then when you get to that position, you now see that they were actually robbed. So we've always had these bandits. The reason why they're now kidnapping people and taking them to the forest and demanding for ransom is because largely most of us are actually adopting the whole cashless policy system. And so there's no cash with us. They pick us up. They take us to the bushes. So it's important that we take a pause and say, what is the true plan? Because even if the administration is not there, the next one comes, the whole, everything that you're seeing is still going to be the same. And as far as I'm concerned, as much as the economy is not straightened out, as much as poverty is increasing, as much as inflation is increasing, you're still going to keep having these kinds of pockets of people causing mayhem. And as, as much as you're unable to stop them, they grow, they blossom. Uh, I, I keep telling people, I said the, the situation of Boko Haram 10 years and now isn't the same anymore. In, 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 la, in, sit, in big cities around the country, churches were bombed, mosques were bombed, mami markets in barracks, in barracks were bombed. Places like the UN office in Abuja was bombed. Traveling from a town to another town could take you five, seven hours on a one hour journey simply because there were numerous checkpoints. We are making some progress. However, there are other challenges that are erupting, and we must find what the root causes are to, do, to those challenges. And it still boils down to the family unit. Nobody is talking to the family unit, especially in northern Nigeria, where a lot of people who do not have monies or who do not have resources to take care of a wife and a child are heading up going to marry four children. When we talk about this, everybody gets angry. But we need the backing, the strong backing from the system to say, yes, this kind of makes sense, and we're going to see how it's going to stop. So, um, so many issues and all boils down to the family unit system. That is the root cause of all of the things we're talking about. Uh, aside the family, um, um, Ahmed Buhari, um, religion, I believe, has also played a huge role in some of all these things. And we've gotten to see that there's more people in those regions who are more um, attached to their religion than they are to humanity and they are to governance. Um, in it, any it's way. very dangerous um, for us to say it's very dangerous for us to say religion because when you now dissect the religion itself, you will not find all of those ideologies that these people have pushed forward. So no, it's absolutely, but but, but but I don't know if you would agree that those ideologies still come from a religious perspective somehow, some way. It, it may not be general. Absolute, absolute, absolutely wrong. Absolutely wrong. That some people are deciding to. To, to de 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 design the religion, or it depends on the religion you're talking about. I don't know what religion you're talking about, but it depends on the religion you're talking about. Most of these people have actually decided to present it the way it will comfort them, which is why we must at every turn remind them that this is not the religion. What you are doing is selfish, it's for your own interest, and it's unacceptable. Th this is my point. This is my point. Um, yes, you know, and I've said it earlier, that yes, it is not necessarily what the religion teaches. But the conversation still comes from a religious perspective. It is only, you know, turned, you know, in a totally different direction to suit what they are trying to achieve. So it's still coming somehow from religion. It, it may not be exactly what the religion teaches. It might be completely different from what the religion teaches, but it's still coming from a religious perspective. Now, that's the point that I was trying to make. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier the body language of the, of the government and something that you also said that, the, that doesn't seem to anybody who wants to, maybe because of pride, doesn't want to actually, you know, pull the Nigerian people together and have conversations with the Nigerian people to let them know the reasons for some of their, you know, decisions. Um, the question I want to ask next is, um, when you take these decisions, look at the pictures that have been flashing on the screen. These are supposedly repentant terrorists drinking, you know, soft drinks and, you know, they're, they're being given, you know, packs of, uh, of groceries. Um, when, you, when you make moves like that, it should anger a couple of, you know, a certain amount of people. But if the government is not doing what it can to, first of all, of course, read the, the, those areas of poverty, to change the narrative in those areas, to fix some of the lack that exists in those areas. When you said earlier that the government has failed these people, it, is the government in any way showing that it is you know, starting to be different with regards to governance in those areas? Well, um, I'm happy to an extent with the current governor of Borno State. I was with him like three days ago. And I did, you know, at that point, I posed this question to him. And we did have a deep talk. This has, this has been my views for a while now. But when I sat down and talked with him, I think it was a three-minute talk. But the truth of the matter is, he's actually confused as well. Just the same way I am confused. And I'm sure many people are confused. And we're thinking, what is the best way to handle this kind of situations? Because they probably will still be your core. Or okay. should I say... Um, the people that have been in the IDP camps nearly eight, ten years, 
what measures have we in, in, adopted to see that we are actually even talking to them to see how they can think normally? Because there are some of them in the IDP camps, especially those around Bruno, who are saying, I'm suffering the IDP, IDP camp. I'm not eating properly. I'm being maltreated. Their women are being raped in the IDP camps by some security personnel. In the IDP camps, there are people who have become godfathers who actually maltreat other people in the IDP camps. What so so when you look at those things, you now see that the system is still failing them while in the IDP camps. Some of them escape from the IDP camps to find solace with the supposedly killers who have put them in that situation. There's so much that is going wrong. And I want us to ask our I want us to point our fingers to the right quarters and say, what are you doing to fix these problems? Because if we do not do the right things, they're gonna persist. All right, let's bring in Mr. Aguli back into the conversation. Mr. Aguli, welcome back. Yes, uh, thank you. Th thank you very much. And I, and I, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead with your train of thought. Yes, I want, I want to disagree totally with Mr. Buhari because he is he more Nigerian than me. I'm a full-blooded Nigerian. I've been an analyst on Plus TV for many occasions. In the UK, the network is always steady. And in Nigeria, all the times that have come on, the network is not steady. I don't like, it's not as a reason to be accepting mediocrity and saying it happens everywhere else in the world. Now, back to the point I was saying, Mr. Buhari is talking about the detainees who were arrested from Konshisha have not been killed. If they have been killed, amnesty we're talking about. But that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that here we're talking about giving amnesty or reintegrating Boko Haram terrorists, people who are people. But in Konshisha local government of Benue, when bandits there killed the Nigerian army personnel, this same government that is treating Boko Haram with kid gloves went to Konshisha with power. They bought the place. They bought their food. They bought their houses and everything. And then they arrested the people who are currently in detention. Even the governor of Benue said, handed over traditional rulers to the military, to be prosecuted. We in the same country, why can we be in a country where some terrorists have been treated like kings, and then some be treated with brutal force? If we continue running a country like this, there will be no country. And I want Mr. Buhari to know about that. And it is for that reason that I'm fully aligned with the statement by Mr. Udo Okbe, the ACF, that this Boko Haram terrorist will be brought to justice. Uh, but, uh, Mr. Agole, Mr. Court, Agole, do you understand? Let them show evidence that they were actually, that were, they were actually taking into, into terrorism without their own agreement. Yeah, so, so that's what I wanted to bring in. Do you understand uh, Ahmed Buhari's point that some of these persons weren't necessarily or regionally terrorists? They were kidnapped and forced into these um, actions. Do you ag agree that for people like that, they maybe should be um, treated different? Okay, so we have the cases of the chief of girls. Because the chief of girls were taken away from their school, forced, Without their own volition, any time they have space, they escape. They escape from the terrorists and return home. If these people were taken, confiscated by force, they had opportunities to return home. They had opportunities to give, get, give themselves up to the military. They didn't do that. So what Mr. Buhari is saying to happen in court, let them come in court, and their defense in court to be that they were truly constricted without their own agreement into terrorism. All right, Mr. Agule. Mr. Agule, that's a, good, that's a good place to leave it for now. Obviously, this is a conversation that we will continue to have until we find and come to a place of understanding. Um, thank you very much, Public Affairs Analyst Mr. Nick Agule, for your time. Um, a politician, uh, Mr. Ahmed Buhari, thank you too for joining us. Thank Okay, so we'll take a break here to return to discuss the petroleum industry bill. Our oil expert, Mr. Balazaka, is on standby. <laughs>